Uh, thanks, Christina. And on behalf of Christina and Jill D'Alessandro, the Curator of Textile Arts here at the De Young, uh, I also would like to extend our, our welcome to you um, to, and thank you for coming uh, to this morning's symposium. Um, and uh, we've got a great program for you today, a great set of speakers. As Jill, or as, as Christina mentioned, uh, we do have the, uh, this exhibition of material um, uh, from the Vatican Ethnographic Museum upstairs. Certainly want you to take a look at that. Um, and, and in a way, what could be more canonical than objects uh, from the Vatican? Uh, my task here at this a way of sort of setting the stage is um, to, to get us into that idea of canon. Uh, and in, in a way, what I wanted to do was go back to actually how we think about this word, uh, what this word actually means. Um, and again, what source could be more canonical than the Oxford English Dictionary? Uh, and as I was sort of going down these definitions and these examples, uh, I was really struck by how much emphasis is placed on text. Um, that the idea of canon uh, originally really did have everything to do with texts, and quite specifically religious texts. And it's not really until much later in the game, uh, culturally speaking, historically speaking, that we get down to um, that, that sort of second definition there. Uh, the list of works considered to be permanently established uh, as being of the highest quality. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about canon and how things come into the canon, how things are placed into the canon. Uh, but one of the interesting things that I think we'll, we'll all have to think about today is how objects come into the canon um, and, and what, that, uh, what that takes. Uh, any visitor to a place like the Vatican has the chance to see uh, some of the most canonical works of art in the Western tradition, uh, things like the Sistine Chapel, of course. Uh, but the creation of this canon of objects drawn from the past um, must recognize that our knowledge of history is imperfect, changing, uh, and variable, depending on time and place. In short, it is anything but permanent. Uh, we have to acknowledge this contingency, and we have to acknowledge that these objects have life in a way. They're born, they're made, they live, they circulate in different spaces, um, and they, they die. They're buried, uh, they're destroyed. Um, and in this respect, they are quite human. Um, but like the divine characters that populate much of the world's religious texts, they can occasionally be resurrected and live again. Uh, and the Laocoon of the first century BC, of course, uh, is a prime example of this kind of resurrection, uh, since it was uncovered in Rome in 1506 uh, and now has pride of place uh, in the Vatican galleries. Uh, and I show you here just a, a little spot of where it was actually found in Rome. Um, its rediscovery prompted significant reevaluations of the past and essentially reset the horizons of aesthetic and cultural possibility in the moment that it was discovered. And, it, and so it became canonical, even as many of its details of origin uh, were and continue to be debated today. Uh, what would have happened uh, if Pope Julius II had not been such an avid enthusiast of classical antiquity? Would it, this object have survived to become the icon that it is today? As an Americanist, I'm always struck by the similarities between the story of the discovery of the Laocoon and the impact that it had uh, with the antiquity, um, uh, or it, well, excuse me, with the equally accidental discovery of the Aztec calendar stone in downtown city, uh, Mexico City uh, in 1790. And again, a shot of downtown Mexico City with a little star showing you where it came from. Um, this object uh, was probably made at around the same time that the, the Laocoon was rediscovered. Uh, so it's actually had a longer life in the modern era than it had for the Aztecs uh, who made it uh, and wondered at it later in the uh, 15th or early 16th century. Uh, its resurrection in the 18th century prompted a new assessment of Aztec culture and art. And essentially this moment uh, and its publication in 1792 marks the beginning of the modern study of uh, pre-Columbian past. Uh, for us uh, as uh, pre-Columbian specialists, there is hardly anything more canonical than the Aztec calendar stone. Uh, but for all their monumental permanence, our understandings of the canonical position of the Laocoon uh, and the calendar stone can change, uh, as both uh, these two additional objects that I show you here at the top uh, illustrate. Uh, on the left, the, as you're looking at it, the monolith of Tlaltecutli, uh, which was discovered in downtown Mexico City in 2006, uh, is now uh, acknowledged uh, as the largest Aztec sculpture uh, that we know up to date. Um, it's canonical by virtue of its sheer size. 
Uh, similarly, the discovery in 1957 of a group of monumental uh, sculptural fragments at the Tiberian Villa, villa of uh, Sperlonga uh, are thought to be, have been carved by the same artists that created the Laocoon. So our sense of what belongs in the canon and why can change over time. What would have happened if the Tlaltecutli had been discovered before the Calendar Stone or the Sperlonga monuments before uh, the Laocoon? Of course, uh, the insertion of the so-called primitive arts into the canon of the Western art tradition uh, via modern painting is one of the moments when uh, our notion of the canon changed most profoundly, albeit not unproblematically. The story of Picasso and his contemporaries making their first encounter with African masks at the Trocadero in Paris is one of our most canonical texts. Uh, it is the founding myth of departments of the arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas in museums all over the United States. Uh, although tellingly, uh, not so much in Europe and Latin America, where these objects tend to stay in natural history and anthropology museums. For many years, art from these areas uh, has been included into the canon only in as much as it can be connected to Western art traditions. But today, our speakers will remind us of the problematic contingency of this kind of canon formation, that chance discovery, passing taste, institutional bias, personal preference, and structural inequality all operate as limits on the objects that are available for us to consider as candidates for canonization. Uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our curator of textile arts, Jill D'Alessandro, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you.